My name is John Passfield. I'm going to read from my novel, Pauline Johnson, Know Who I Am. The title of this reading will be Pauline Johnson, Video 2, Pauline's Career. So here is the cover, Pauline Johnson, Know Who I Am, a novel by John Passfield. That's a photograph from two, uh, 2012, I almost said 1912, 1912, a year before she died, a backyard snapshot. Here's a summary on the back of the novel. Pauline Johnson was born on the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario, Canada. Was she American, British, or Canadian? Was she Mohawk, English, or mixed? She added up her assets and her liabilities and decided that the Pauline that the world would see would be Pauline the performance artist, Pauline on stage. As for the real Pauline, she would keep that to herself. Now here's a, a note on terminology which I put on the back of the title page. Such terms as First Nations, Aboriginal, and Indigenous were not in common usage at the time at which the events of a novel take place. To refer to her mother's people, the historical Pauline Johnson used the terms English and white. To refer to her father's people, she used the terms Indian, Mohawk, and red. While the novel's fiction, I've used Pauline Johnson's terms throughout the novel in the interest of historical accuracy. Now, how do you structure the life of a person who lived every day of her 50 years. Well, I made a few decisions in order to capture not the thousands of days and details, but to capture the essence of Pauline Johnson's life. The novel takes place, every word, in the mind of the main character. I decided that she would think of her life in 16 chapters of thought and that she would think of her life as having been lived in eras, in blocks of time. Number one, life at her childhood home of Chiefswood. Number two, her first visit to London, England. Number three, touring Canada. Number four, her second visit to London, England. Number five, touring Canada again. And then finally, number six, retiring to live in Vancouver. So this makes for six blocks of time, six eras as she sees it in the life of herself, the main character of this novel. So I'll read just a few image units from each block of time. So there's 16 chapters, there's 50,000 words, and each chapter has about 50 of what I call image units. An image unit could be a single line, it could be a single paragraph, or it could be two or three paragraphs. So there's about 50 image units. I'll read one per chapter, starting with chapter 1, page 9. So this is the first era of her life, life at home at Chiefswood. A quiet day in Brantford, to the market, and then back home. Well, letter in the mailbox, invited to Toronto, to the Young Men's Liberal Club, to read a poem. What shall I read? What shall I read? What among my poems should I read? However, there's one thing that I know. I don't want anyone to read it for me. This time, I'm determined that I shall read. Well, that's the only image I'm going to read from chapter one. Here's chapter two, still at Chiefswood, her childhood home and her home where she lived as a youth. Toronto, beckoning Toronto. The town where the poets all ply their trade. Roberts, Carmen, Lampman, Scott, even a female poet or two. And the publishers, ah, oh, the publishers, I shall knock on every door. Toronto, challenging Toronto. Doors swing open, doors swing shut. I stand before your doors as simply Pauline. So, uh, again, uh, two chapters there, but I'm only reading two uh, images from those chapters. If we move on to chapter three here, just looking for a page, we're into the second era in her life. Uh, chapter three, four, five, her first visit to London, England. England, oh my England, taking the day train down from Liverpool to London, enchanted by the English countryside 
My mother's people might have lived here for a thousand years, eager to dip my hands in the treasure trove. A Banu for my presentations, a publisher for my poems, a promoter for my talent, to visit the tower and model the jewels as I admire myself in the mirror, blinking my eyes at the blinding flash, to squeeze my heritage for every drop that it is worth. So very optimistic on her first visit to London. That was chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 4, page 27 here, and read only one image from the second first visit to London chapter. Finding my way around London. Sometimes sunshine, and sometimes fog, paying out far too much of my savings for London cabs. I can walk my way to an interview with a publisher or a theater manager, but I cannot walk to a fancy mansion in a gown. Effusive praise when I read my poems for the elites, but some of them send a carriage for me, and some of them don't. So, making her way in London, but not uh, all that easy. Let's go to chapter 5, if I can find the... Uh, Page number, page 35, I'll get it here. This is the third uh, visit to London, first visit to London chapter, the last one, before she goes home to Canada. Wondering whether to leave England, my mother's England. Well, not exactly with my tail between my legs, not hiding like the poor fox amid the bang of the hounds, but sitting in my den and comparing my losses and my gains. I've written newspaper articles, but in London, oh, sorry, got mixed up there. I've written newspaper articles, good to read and to wrap the fish. I'm having my poems published, but in London, a book only lives on its latest reviews. I've been taken up as a curiosity, not as an equal, but as an entertainer, and such welcome is no longer lasting than the soup. So there's, uh, that's chapter five. There's a whole chapter, of course, of leaving London, deciding to leave London. But we'll leave that and we'll go on to chapter six. Now the first touring Canada era, chapters six, seven, and eight. Page 43. Planning a Canadian tour at home in Brantford and leaving again. My mother's house seems so tiny after the places where I've been. An interview with the Brantford Expositor. Brantford shines on the world stage, so a headline in the local newspaper. Sly digs from my sister Eva. Why not stay home and look after mom? Tragic despair from my disappointed mother. How could a daughter of mine sink so low as to perform on the public stage? So, uh, a little difficulty there in convincing her family that she's on the right track. Let's go to chapter 7, leaving a whole chapter behind. Page 51, I'll get it here in a minute. It's the second chapter of her first tour of Canada. Oh, I should be home in Brantford. A letter from Eva was at the desk waiting for me. The usual barbs against my profession, but a new note is added this time. Mother's ailing. Mother is ailing. She often wishes that you would come home. Is this a ploy from devious Eva? Is Mother actually in need of my help? We are so busy here on the road. We are booked in every town along the CPR. Well, Canadians would know that CPR is Canadian Pacific Railway, which tied Canada together in the 19th century. That's the 1880s, 1890s. And so being booked on every town, in every town along the CPR, I mean, she's very busy uh, presenting her poems and, and performing. Chapter 8, still with the first tour, page 59, first tour of Canada. Canada is such a vast country. New settlements are opening up all the time. It's a great country to write about. A boy was sitting on a fence rail as a train went gliding by, just outside the little village where we had just done our show. I always carry my writing case, pens and ink and paper, so I got it out and I thought for a while and the lines just started to flow. I'm calling it Joe, though I don't know his name. A little semi-savage boy of nine, that's in italics, it's a line from the poem, reading it over and changing some words. I'll read it on stage tonight in the next little town. So the career is going well. Chapter uh, 
8. That was chapter 8, so we have finished the uh, first Touring Canada era. I have to flip a page here so I can follow my, my notes. So now we go into chapter 9. 9, 10, and 11 will be the second visit to London. So it's one thing to be uh, successful in your home country. But in those days, it was the British Empire, and people saw themselves as Britishers. And so, you know, T.S. Eliot, an American, uh, George Bernard Shaw, an Irishman, and so on, all these people went to London, and, and people inside the U.K. went to London as well. It was a draw. If you want to uh, succeed on the big stage, you go to London, England. So here she is back in London in Chapter 9, second visit to London. Arrival in England again. High hopes for London. High hopes for London town. The second of my, the scene of my triumphs in the past. We stand at Trafalgar Square and look around. My partner is overwhelmed by what he sees. Yes, it is the center of empire, Walter. The city at the center of the world. Anyone who is a king here, in any profession or any endeavor, is an emperor in every kingdom on the earth. We both jump back as the London cabbie cuts close to the curve. So uh, a lot of success available there, but hey, be careful, eh? Uh, that's chapter 9. We go to chapter 10, still in London, for the second visit. I'll find page 75 here. Here we are. Dominion Day in London. Now, we'd say Canada Day today, but uh, this was Dominion Day at the time. All the Canadians come together to celebrate a recital at Lord Trascona's garden party. My partner and I are each called upon to read a poem. Reading again at Steinway Hall and once or twice at social events. No money changes hands. A series of links that make no chain. Plenty of greetings, but no engagements. Pleased to see you. Welcome back. We so enjoyed it when you read at our salon in 94. Well, that was the first visit, 94. She was... Uh, New and different then, unique. And now she's the same Pauline coming back 10, 12 years later. Uh, that's chapter 10. The third chapter of the second visit to London, we'll go to page 83 here. Again, leaving out a whole chapter of imagery about that experience. London, London, London. The water is so low in the well that the bucket comes up empty. What is there more that I can do? Which London rose have I not yet plucked and put in my vase? Is it the Duchess or is it the butler who guards the door? Well, chapter 10, and that's the leaving London for the second time chapter. There's, again, uh, 50 or so images about that, but we'll just leave them for, for now. Chapters 12, 13, 14, the second tour of Canada. And here's page uh, 91 for one uh, image in chapter 12. Touring Canada, again, touring the length of Canada for the second time. One more sweep from coast to coast. No city too small, no village too big, no stage too makeshift to be a platform for Pauline. In need of a joke to tickle your funny bone? In need of a poem to pierce your heart? Want the agony of the disenchanted? Want the songs of the brave and the strong? I have a great big bag that I drag out onto the stage. All the emotions that I've collected over the years. So then a whole chapter on that. But we'll move on to chapter 13, page 99. For the second uh, chapter of the second Canada tour. Sometimes rich, sometimes poor. Sometimes a crushing a schedule. Sometimes not a booking to be had. Sometimes sitting on a bench looking spellbound at the Atlantic. Sometimes a picnic on a blanket and looking out over the Pacific. A glass of wine and a chicken wing in my hands. Better than sitting in a tiny little room in a tiny little town and wondering why I didn't go out into the big wide world. And then chapter 14, page 107, coming to the end of her touring life, sensing that things are coming to an end, feeling old and feeling tired, my day's energy draining away in a few short hours. 
unable to get much sleep, feeling uneasy when about to go on stage. Not the old zip in my performances that I always used to have. Do I want to see a doctor? There's one in every town. Do I really want to know what might be wrong? And then we'll leave the rest of chapter 14 and move into the last two chapters, 15 and 16, which are the settling in Vancouver at the end of her stage career chapters. Moving to Vancouver, moving into a new little house, my new little house. Careful with the tea service, been in my family for many years. Most of my family things are in that cardboard box. Oh, Vancouver is such a lovely city. Were you born here or did you come from somewhere else? Obviously speaking to the person who's helping her to move in. And then chapter 16, the final chapter of the novel. What better place to live than Vancouver? Edge of the water, edge of the land. Admit thoughts as I care to entertain them. Keep them at bay when I'd prefer to be alone. At times, I want the whole day to myself. So, again, there's the rest of the chapter, uh, chapter 16, the final chapter, but we'll leave that. Here's a note that I wrote as I was reading this, these passages over. We all live through many days and many experiences. We all think about what has happened to us, both what we have caused to happen in our lives and what has happened over which we had no control. All of these experiences are in our minds as information. Much of it, what we had for breakfast two weeks ago today, or what gasoline used to cost 10 years ago, is left in our memories, undisturbed, as trivial. But certain items of information, such as the visit to London, England, and what was expected to happen, and what actually did happen, present themselves to our minds as significant information. And when we think of one item of significant information, our first visit to London, England, we often think of another related item of significant information, our second visit to London, England. And this is a definition of imagery. Two items of information which have been placed in close proximity by a controlling mind, the mind of Pauline Johnson in this case, and which call for an interpretation, an idea as to why these two items of information have been placed side by side by the meaning-seeking force in the mind. Now, I've chosen in my novels to present this level of thinking and no more. I present the significant information by which the main character is thinking. I present the pattern in which she arranges this information, which is the image pattern which cries out for interpretation. More than this, though, I do not do. I do not tell you, the reader, what interpretation the main character, Pauline Johnson, makes of the image pattern of her thoughts. I leave that to you. If you like to be told what to think, this novel will be unrewarding. But if you like to think, then the novel will have its rewards. So the novel, once again, is Pauline Johnson, Know Who I Am, a novel by John Passfield. It's found on Amazon, and there's more information there. It's also found on my uh, publisher's website, which is rocksmillspress.com, R-O-C-K-S-M-I-L-L-S-P-R-E-S-S.com. Now, on my website, johnpassfield.ca, J-O-H-N-P-A-S-S-F-I-E-L-D.ca, two books, two free books, free of access. I make a planning notebook. I get an idea. I structure it. I uh, work through the writing process. I encounter uh, challenges and uh, hopefully come up with uh, workable solutions. And I record all of that. So that's available. Just click on the icon. Secondly, when I have a rough draft, which in this case is 50,000 words, I take about a month to polish it. And as I do so, I ask myself uh, how this novel is working. Uh, How is it... uh, 
again over previous novels I've written, what might I do uh, in future in terms of novel writing? What is a novel? How does a, a novel work as a, a means of uh, literary communication? All kinds of topics like that. So that's all available. All you do is go to my website, johnpassville.ca, click on it, there it is for free. And lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.